Hello, everyone. Welcome to my film. I'm Chi Fang Kobet. I'm a fine artist specializing in narrative drawings, illustrations, and video installations. Many of my works explore the interactions and coexistence between human and nature, and the individual identities in a transforming society. Narrative art has always fascinated me in its range of forms. Including the Renaissance frescoes, book illustrations, decorations on the ceramics, and so forth. Back in 2010, I started a long, ongoing journey exploring the possibilities of narrative languages via alternative mediums, including drawing, ink and water painting, video installations, and ceramics. It has been an extensive and enlightening journey to explore. How my artistic pursuit is performed, reinvented, and reformed by、uh, different art mediums and languages. Many of my creative practice and arts explores and utilizes freehand drawing and accidental discovery and creations of shapes and forms. They are created directly from my imagination and memories to capture the flowing nature of human mind and life experience. I attribute this approach to a love of stream of consciousness literature, for example, Virginia Woolf's and James Joyce literatures, Taoism philosophy, and Ambato Echoes, the open art theory. I often use the stream of consciousness method to activate my mind, feelings, and ideas. For example, when I carve a new ceramic work or drawing on paper, I might start from a corner, a figure, a shape, or even a dot, and let it grow to the forms it chooses. I did my PhD in fine art and art history. From 2014 to 2019, I undertook a major research project to explore my narrative concepts in a bigger physical environment. Static drawings and paintings were animated and projected in a large scale onto the physical spaces or objects to transform them into a dream-like fiction, where people can actually physically walk around. And be immersed into the fictional world. The whole room was turned into a big narrative picture. The sensational environment filled with murals of lights, sounds, and emotions separated the audience from reality, and triggered bodily engagement in a fictional world. I particularly enjoy playing around with the transformation from something really small. Which can sit on your hand, to a large environment where you can physically step into. It opens a new door onto myself and my practice to see the connections between me, my audience, as an intimate talk and an adventurous collaboration. What's more, my experience and finding in these installations. Has a great impact on my ceramic practice, and during the pandemic, where physical experience was beyond touch, my research and practice carried on with new medium of ceramic. One method I eventually found suitable was graffito, an ancient international decoration technique to make contrasting design by scratching the top color off. I made a collection of scrapito boxes to create little rooms or theaters which can be held or touched by hand. As with my PhD practice to turn a two-dimensional image to a three-dimensional object using projection, I undertook a similar approach in creating my slab-built boxes by using their edges as frames of windows or rooms. In which my characters live out their dramas. Different faces of the cuboid were connected by the expanding shapes and actions. For example, viewed from the front, people can see two faces looking towards the window, just like us. Following the sight, we can see crocodiles. 
when you turn the pot towards you, you will see what happens above. There are girls sitting on top of the box to tease the crocodiles with handkerchiefs. The screw fistful technique gave my work a stunning visual impact, with its strong contrasts. I enjoyed carving the colors slipped off and creating the shallow relief-like textures. It is great for bold designs, but equally sometimes tricky to make small delicate details. It requires good planning to paint the shapes and create nice compositions. I therefore undertook further research of other techniques, and become attracted to some medieval Chinese and European line carving techniques. Another major influence was my residency at Darren Sixth Form. I made an immersive wall collage based on freehand drawing, collage, and ceramic pieces. When I installed the exhibition, I held the collage pieces in my hands, moved them around. To form new compositions, I saw them as intimated objects rather than a piece of paper. I could touch and feel their textures, which inspired me to transform this experience onto clay. I began to experiment on small tiles. I cut them to irregular shapes, and used a pin tool to cut the designs I had made. I got several nice pieces, which helped to realize my goal for the first time. Which was incredibly exciting. This progress gave me more confidence to make something big, something different with the cuboids, something more organic and accidental to echo with my drawings. I wanted to make a form which was more than a carrier of the pictures, but also the free-growing objects themselves. There should be some living forms which respond to the stream of consciousness. And a free association of forms. I built two pots with irregular tops and holes. It was tricky to add small irregular shaped slabs on top. I wasn't sure they could even survive in the first firing, but they did to my delight. I coated them with clear glaze and gave them a glossy finish. I was very happy with this progress, which demonstrated to me. How well my pictures could be put on ceramics without losing their characters or aesthetics. I called them the Adam and Eve of my later ceramic pieces, as they kicked start a new chapter of my creativity. I immediately started to experiment with and adopt this technique in my own way, and to emphasize the sense of flow which I pursued, I began to make more organic shapes. Which better echoed my stream of consciousness, drawing nature and style. In my home-based workshop, I use a slab roller to create smooth and consistent slabs from stoneware, then hand-build them into shapes. The process is very slow compared to throwing on a wheel, but I do enjoy it as it is a slow journey which allows me to capture ideas that popped into my mind. For the most of my works, I don't use templates to unify the sizes and shapes. Instead, I create to see them as organic, growing matters, which chose their own way to express what they would like to be, almost responding to their own environment and my emotions and the motion of hands. I carved into the clay when it is leathery hard with my paint tools. It is a very slow but meditating experience when the paint scratches across the surface of the clay. The shape of the clay body tells me what and where to carve. When I made this tovas, I thought about something coming down from the top of a tree, so I carved a monkey reaching out for something unknown below. Then the monkey told me I needed to put some figures down there. To interact with it. Sometimes my picture came first in my mind on the sketchbook. When I went to Walsingham Country Show in County Durham, I was fascinated by the rare chickens kept in the cages, observed and judged by people who potentially could put their hands in one and bring them home.
I imagined this vase as a bird cage, to be held by hands, and brought to an unknown destination, a cage to hold some giant roosters, watched by three female figures sitting on the top. The finished work was quite different with original plan on my sketchbook, but I see it a very good proof to show how my ideas and concept developed by the stream of consciousness naturally, which is inspiring to new narratives and accidental funs. Once carved, the pieces need to get bone dry prior to being cleaned and smoothed down. To remove all the blurs and dust and crumbs, there are piles of dust and crumbs needed to be brushed out gently. Sometimes it felt like doing the carving over and over again. It is a very long, tedious, and dusty work, which require good protection with a mask. Your eyes are always busy looking out for deficiencies and faults. The bisque fired pot is smooth and clear, but it is hard to see the carving when the clay turns from dark to a pale beige. The next stage is one of the most rewarding and revealing. Applying the inlay is very exciting as it is the first time for me to see my designs clearly. I normally use decorative slips to paint the surface first. The slip. Will fully cover the pot, which I apply carefully to fill up all the carved gaps, marks, and lines. Then I wipe off the color with a damp cloth or sponge. It's a very messy job that requires a lot of water to keep the cloth clean. The finished inlay gives the work a draft look. And the first time for me to see how well my ideas and the carved narratives worked on the pot. After this stage, I then apply clear glaze to seal the surface, and sometimes boldly colored glaze inside to frame the illustrations and create a contrast against the monochrome drawings. After the second firing to 1,270 degrees, I get to see the final work. Which is in any potter studio is the most exciting and nervous rocking experience. Did the color work? Has the glaze run? Are there any cracks or faults? All of these fears and many more are running through my mind. However, after years of experimenting, I have now got to the stage where the majority of my words came out perfectly. Which fill me with a huge joy and a satisfaction every single time I open the kiln door. They often explore social changes, human nature interactions, and identities. Many of the characters I made reference mythological elements as a trigger to reimagine with a new connotation and narratives. Humans, animals, plants, objects. And the life-changing and daily events, such as going to a zoo or fishmongers, folklores, and even my dreams, all of this can inform and inspire my new narratives on the pot. They are playful, quirky, and sharp to the eyes. With each illustration, narrative, and the shape of the vessel, calling for creative observation. I believe seeing is a continuous process, and it traces the development of ideas in a picture. The picture has no central views, no dominating elements on my parts. It is like a tightly woven web, which connects all parts in a non-discriminatory way. They are open to interpretations, so you can make your own minds as to where to start and what the narrative is. I call this a visual journey, a tour that you direct yourself based on your own life experience, your pace and interest. You may be distracted by unexpected elements, or even confused. That requires you to stop, consider, and change your idea each time you look at it, and depending on where you start.
I regard all of this experience a valuable part of my narrative. I have found when people observe my ceramics works, they tend to turn it around in their hands, peeking through the holes for the hidden treasures and meanings. You can see what happens in different sections when you turn the pot. With the first glancing look, you may catch some big figures and have a quick impression on what the story is like. You turn it to the left or right, you may find different outcomes, as each narrative is circular, and there is no right, left, up, or down to the story. Everything should be subjective and inspiring. Some pots require you to stand up to see what is hidden inside. On the outside of this pot, I put several tigers against the bars, but you don't know they are actually inside or outside the cage. If you think they are inside, it implies you are standing inside the cage with them. If you feel the tigers are outside the cage, you may need to think there are tigers escaping from the zoo. However, the two tigers carved on the bottom of the pot are in the cage for sure. But is this the beginning or the ending of the story? I leave this open for the observers to decide, which may change every time they look at it. I'm always curious about the way people observing things. The way of looking is more than receiving information sent by the image. I wish my ceramics to be objects to animate the audience's way of seeing. I wish my audience to explore the layers of narratives when they look out for attractions and curiosities. The visible is always connected with invisible and my works attempt to emphasize this connection. When I make something obvious, I tend to distract my audience away from it. That's why I make many holes on my pots to create an active looking through experience. My audience are invited to look through the holes so they can explore the multi-dimension of my narratives. The holes on the pots are portals to another invisible world of narrative psychologically and physically. It connects both dimensions by breaking up the solid boundary. The missing content of the whole is the breakage of a solid surface. This imperfection of the exterior space exposes the being of the inside space. The whole brings the outside air into the inside. It exposes the inside contents and color and creates the depth of contrast. This concept is deeply associated with my wall colleges. In this wall college, the mountain-like object has some little openings where individual elements can go in. Little doors, cages, and holes open up portals for the miniatures to hide and dwell. The view looks different when framed by holes. There are more than gaps between the visible and invisible, but also pull the audience inside. They invite them to look up and down, bend their knees, and to get close to the wall. They remind the viewers there is something behind the sign. They remind the viewers something existing but unreachable. It is a natural human curiosity to peep in holes. There are so many literatures and theories behind this simple but historical human behavior. My ceramics echo to this and it triggers the pursuit of curiosity, as well as to unveil the coexistence of lives in multiple dimensions. On this pot, I opened up holes in the front wall. You can see a caterpillar crouching along the bottom through the big hole, while you see nothing through the others. The caterpillar is framed by the hole and separated from the exterior story. Well, at the same time, the hole implies a possible escape plan to the outside. In this cake-like pot, the hole stands between alternative fates of a slice of cake. Through the hole we can see a cake slice falling down and about to meet its end crushed on the floor. 
while the cake slides on the outside keeps its shape well, this peeping hole is a little connection point to possibilities of this and that. One concept about my art practice is about psychological projection. I enjoy making many faceless characters on my ceramic and 2D works because I see them as a medium of psychological projection. Some have no faces, some have their faces covered up or hidden. I give these characters minimal traits and definitions, and I think the audience can use them as costumes to participate in my narrative. They are waiting to be defined by the viewer who holds them by hand. They are empty vessels to be filled in. In both Eastern and Western terms, many classical paintings show how ancient artists set up the role-play game in their works. This is not due to the lack of techniques of observation of nature, or they couldn't draw it realistically. Many artists intended to create ambiguous and neutral faces for free imagination. In this way, they can invite their viewers to play roles in their own story. The faceless woman is one of the many characters I create to perform this drama. I adopted this image from a life drawing from my sketchbook, a woman in a dress looking back towards me in a large summer hat. Her arm rests on her waist as if she has just finished a hard day's work. I see her as an independent but solitary woman who needs to make important decisions. On many of my parts, I let her play as decision maker in tricky situations. She often appears as a faceless figure whom the viewers can project their own identities in. On this part, she is a beekeeper who has to deal with the invasion of honey badgers. Her missing face shows a situation with no answers. Should she help the badger or the honeybees? They are equally important to our life and nature. Should she intervene or stand by? What is her role in standing between the two counterparts of nature? On another work, she is holding a bunch of ropes while touching the badger. Maybe she has made the decision to catch the badger to protect the bees. On a sibling piece, she appears as an empty shell of clothing floating in the air, but she got a new face on her skirt looking at many faces on the balloons. Maybe she's waiting for the viewers to decide her role and identity. These incomplete figures require the viewers to make their own interpretations, which can be influenced by their own life views and experience. They cannot be completed with people's intervention. The missing part is a statement of the absence of the valuable. It asks you what is missing and why. The holes in my pot create physical entrance to see through the pot an entrance to go into the inside, private, interior space, an absence of contents to be filled up with viewers' ideas. On this part, the face is hidden beyond the body of the ceramic, but it is there in its own world. The ceramic body standing between her and me is a barrier between the fictional and the reality, and also the maker and the audience. This woman tries to break through a wall. Her body is in our side, while her head is on the other side. It is her way to invite you to guess who she is, what's the expression of her hidden face. This girl stands on the edge of the cliff. Her body grows too tall to be held by the small frame of my pot. This mermaid hides her face with a smile. A face comes out of her face. Whose face is it? Is the mermaid looking at it or not? Those two girls blind their eyes 
so they can feel with their hands. The objects in a bowl are definitely fruits for sure by looking. But when you feel a fruit with hands, it turns to be a living creature with butterfly wings. This little figure wears swimming suit like a lobster. It even has a face mark with a lobster head. What will it see? Does it see as human or a lobster? Does it know how to answer the phone presented to her? There is no single correct answer to my part. What only matters is what the viewer wish to see, to believe, or imagine. Another crucial aspect of my expression is the contrast between the big and the small. I'm very keen on building contrast between the miniatures and giants. In the limited space of a picture or a pot, there are always miniatures living in the gaps of the big ones. Miniature is something taking the minimum space. Its tiny scale makes it unnoticeable in contrast of the giants, which grab your attention in the first place. The miniature seems insignificant, forgettable, weak and vulnerable, while the giant shows a power, domination and a threat. I feel the interaction between both small and big figures is unveiling and enlightening. In my college installation, The Misplaced Contentment, I made plenty of small figures ranging from human shapes animals and objects. They make their lives in a mountain-like space. They come in and out of the windows, playing behind the mountain's rocks, playing hide and seek. It is not easy to spot all the small figures at the first glance, as your eyes will be attracted by the big ones. But they begin to unveil themselves and their secret lives to you when you walk closer and observe. You have to move around to look up and down. You will find the playful relationship between these little creatures and the big ones. Their interaction, tension and connections grasps me with their psychological implications. Their coexistence calls for imagination to interpret are the big birds ruling the little ones? Are they going to eat them? Are the miniatures at the mercy of the big ones? Sometimes I make the same character in both big and small scales. This drawing is no bigger than a postcard. Well, when it's turned to an animation and projected on the wall, it turns itself to a dominant giant. It illuminates the dark space and it turns it to a big cage for the visitors to walk around. Gallery space is a big environment which envelopes its audience. While using ceramic, I can make some small objects to be held by hand. My pods are a wonderland of miniatures and giants to dwell, perform and transform. They are oppositional and rival. They compete for space on a limited surface and display their power. They wait for interpretations and attention of the viewer in the silence. The contrast between the big and the small tells more than what it shows. The little figures find ways to coexist with the big ones, be quiet and submissive in the appearance of the giants. Well, the giants look like miniatures when put in a larger space like a living room. Our hands touch the pot, making them both miniatures living at the mercy of us. Our touches make us fearful giants to those tiny figures we created. We look, we feel, we touch, and eventually we become a part of the competitive game until we notice we are also miniatures in this huge world. When you hold my pot or drawing, you are holding a little world, a volume where both giants and miniatures coexist. They survive in a watch of the giant creatures. They are beyond the glancing look of the viewer 
and stay safe unnoticed. Both mini H's and the giants are vessels of power. They present oppositional ways of surviving. I enjoy making parallel universes of large and small, the hard noticed and the obvious. They remind us to search for ideas rather than being fed with the ready-made. My art practice is a long journey. It fascinates me as it shows me no clear destinations. Instead, it enlightens and inspires me by giving me unexpected hints. It needs me to search for the hidden and neglected elements of life, and bring them back to light. A pot is a fossil to preserve this journey. It stores layers of elements of life. I enjoy stroking the pot. It reminds me how time has transformed it from a soft clay to a solid, smooth, tactile object. The stream of consciousness which flows through my mind has ceased. It has been preserved in a solid body of a fossil. The narratives generated by me has been separated from me and gained an independent life. When I pass it on to another person, I wish my stories can have a new life as a trigger for others' imagination.